have a dating tip for all the single guys here today. Does it count much coming from the pastor? I don't know. I remember my first date with my wife. I took her to a horror movie. <laughs> I think the movie was called Silent Scream or something. I don't know. So we're in the theater and it's dark, you know, and I'm trying to impress her. And uh, the movie starts rolling and so there's all these scary scenes. And my wife, here on our first date, is grabbing my arm. She's so scared. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, this is going well. <laughs> she likes me. <laughs> She's holding my hand and reaching for my arm. And she was scared out of her wits. She would tell me later, but she didn't want to say anything because she wanted to go on the date. Do you remember the first horror movie you ever went to? I mean the first really scary movie that really scared you, scared you to the point that you started to think, oh, maybe evil is real. The Blob? That's going back a ways, Scott. <laughs> but I go back a ways too. When I was, and I am dating myself, when I was a young teen, I went to see the movie The Exorcist. Ah, audience feedback. Yeah, you seen that movie? Whew. I was a young teen. My parents advised me against it. But my friend and I, we really wanted to go. So we went to the Westmont Theater and we stood in this long line. It was like wrapped around the block. It had just come out. Everybody wanted to see this new scary movie. And it was scary. I still today, if it's on one of the channels, movie channels, I just flip past it if I'm flipping around and I see it. I just kind of twitch like, oh, not that again. After that movie, I went home that night and I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep for days. I was so scared. And even then, as a young, young man, I, I thought, does this stuff really happen? Is there really evil in the world and people could be possessed and stuff like that? Is there really something like the devil? Well, as we mature... We realize, oh yeah, those things are true, right? Turn on the news, go on the internet, and look what's happening in the world. And you see what people do to one another. It's terrible, and you realize that Satan is alive and well, and that there is indeed evil. And the Apostle Paul, when he was writing a long time ago to the church in Rome, in what we have in the Bible, what we call the Book of Romans, he had a word for the church about Satan and about evil. And through this summer, I've been preaching from the book of Romans, going for the most part chapter by chapter. And today is the end. It's the 16th chapter. It's the last chapter in Romans. And I'm looking at some of the last verses in the chapter. The very last verses are just sort of Paul signing off and offering a, a word, a personal word to his, his friends. But right before that, the last word that he gives for the church, the last thing that he's going to say it's about Satan. Now, a lot of times when people speak or write a letter, when they come to the end, they sort of summarize what they wanted to say or they, they hit the main point at the end to leave that message with an audience. So I think we need to pay attention to what he is saying. So let me read those few verses. It's in Romans 16, starting at verse 17. The Apostle Paul writes, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I'm full of joy over you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. And then in verse 20, he says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And that's how he's signing off, saying a word about Satan. He knows the church has been battling Satan. All through the, the letter that he's written, he's, he's talked about how Satan has been tempting people in the church 
they haven't been getting along. They've been disagreeing with each other. They've been judging one another. And he's been calling them to be unified and come together as a church. And he says in the end, a warning and a word of encouragement. You know, watch out for the evil one, but remember that he will be crushed one day under your feet. There comes a day when God's kingdom will be known in its fullest and Satan will be bound. But until that time, we still live this life where there is evil, where there are temptations. And how are we to survive in such a world? Well, the Bible actually gives us some help. And I want to lift up a couple of verses from the Bible that uh, provide some, some guidance as we try to live this life um, and fighting off sin and the temptations of Satan. And the first thing I want to say is to be on guard. And I'm looking at sermon notes that are hopefully in your bulletin. If you want to pull that out and follow along, you can. The first word I want to offer is just to be on guard. It says in 1 Peter 5.8, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Check out that image. He's like a, a lion wandering around looking for someone to devour. Someone who's innocent about the ways of good and evil. Someone who's vulnerable. Someone who's not established in faith. Someone who's not rooted in God who might be vulnerable to the, to the works and the wiles of Satan. How might that work? Well, let me read something for you I found. It's called the devil's beatitudes. You know, Jesus gave us beatitudes, right? Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted, all the blesseds. Well, someone has written down the devil's beatitudes. Goes like this Blessed are they who are too tired and too busy to go to church on Sunday, for they are my best workers. Blessed are they who are bored with the minister's mannerisms and mistakes, for they get nothing out of the sermon. Hello, church. Blessed is the church member who expects to be invited to his own church, for he is part of the problem instead of the solution. Blessed are they who gossip, for they cause strife and divisions that please me. Blessed are they who are easily offended, for they soon get angry and quit. Blessed are they who do not give their offerings to carry on God's work, for they are my best helpers. Blessed is he who professes to love God, but hates his brother and sister, for he shall be with me always. Blessed are the troublemakers, for they shall be called children of the devil. And finally, blessed is he who has no time to pray, for he will become easy prey. Hmm, something to think about. Be on guard, first of all, because Satan is real, and he's roaming around, and he's looking for more recruits in his army. Secondly, realize that Satan does have limitations. I think sometimes we give the devil too much credit when things happen. We just, well, what's, there, was a, there was a comedian years ago, Flip Wilson. Um, the older generation will remember. What did he always used to say about the devil? The devil made me do it. That's a cop-out, right? You can make a choice. I make choices. We have free will. Yeah, the devil made me do it. That was kind of his cop out. Well, the devil has limits. We know that from the story of Job. Job was that guy in the Old Testament that God loved. Job was righteous and holy, lived a great life. But then one day, God and Satan had a conversation. And Satan said, well, he's only a good guy, this guy Job, because you bless him so much. If you take away the blessings, you'll find out what he's really made of. And so God says, all right, we'll, we'll let him be a test case. And uh, Job experienced a lot of suffering. But one of the things, one of the ground rules when the little test started was identified in Job 1.12 where it says, But on the man himself do not lay a finger. You can't take his life. You can test him. And he was tested. Remember, he got sick and he lost his family and all those things. But Satan had limits to what he could do. The third point is to take a stand against the devil. Here again is the idea that you don't have to be a victim. You can stand 
on your faith. You can stand on the name of Jesus Christ because I believe that all evil and Satan flee in the name of Christ, the Holy One, the Savior, God's anointed. Take a stand against the devil. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Stand up to the devil. Say, in the name of Jesus, I'm not going your way. I'm not playing your games. But to do that, you have to be focused on who Christ is to find the strength to be able to do that. How does that work? Well, one of the places my family and I have learned to love to go to on vacation is Hershey, Pennsylvania. Anybody been there? Go to Hershey Park? Yeah, yeah roller coaster. <laughs> well, I don't go on many rides anymore. So we don't go to Hershey Park too much, but we go to Hershey to do other stuff. And one of the things they have there is Chocolate World. Doesn't that sound like a place you want to go? Chocolate World. They got a lot of chocolate in Chocolate World. And they also have a little ride you can go on. It's um, these little carts you sit in, and they slowly take you through, and they show you how the chocolate's made, you know. Well, I don't know how other people get on, but because of my wife's uh, disability, we go in a certain entrance, and to get on the cart, you have to go across a platform that's moving. Have you done that? It goes around slowly, but if you're not ready for it, it can be a little, whoa. So, um, so yeah, so the first time we go and I see the platform, you know, swinging around, we have to walk across to get in the cart. There's an attendant there who says, now watch your step, you know, and I'm like, it's all right, buddy, I got it, thank you. Whoa, you know. Once I stepped on I didn't realize you really lose your balance. So the next time we went to Chocolate World, I got serious. And uh, as I approached the moving platform, I, I fixed my eyes on something on the wall in the back. And I said, if I just keep my eyes on that, I don't look down. And that's what I did. And you know what? I walked right across and got in my little cart. Sometimes it's that way in life with Jesus. You know, where is your focus? Is your focus on yourself? Is your focus on just meeting your needs? Or is your focus on something beyond yourself that is a focal point that you can stare at and move toward so that when the rest of your life is shifting and moving, you don't fall because you've got the right focus? That's what I think the Bible's encouraging us to do so that we can find our way and we can avoid the wiles of the devil. Well, the last thing I want to mention is from Ephesians 6. It's this passage that Christians often quote because we need to be reminded of it. It's about this idea of putting on armor. You know, in the old days, they had all this armor they go clinking around in. Um, well, there's a different kind of armor. There's a spiritual armor that we can wear. And the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to a different church, the church at Ephesus, so the book of the Bible is called Ephesians, as he's ending that letter, here again, he's talking about the business of evil and what the church can do. So in chapter 6, he begins at verse 10, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints." That's the armor. 
the armor of God, that if we utilize it, we have protection. And again, I don't want to give Satan too much credit, and I don't usually preach about the devil, but preaching through the book of Romans, this is what's there. And so that's why I'm talking about it today. And I think it's important to hear what Paul's saying. He uses the word full twice. Put on the full armor. Because if you're not fully protected, you are vulnerable. And Satan often knows our weak points and will strike there. Let me give you an example. When our son Josh was, uh, I don't know, I guess around 10, uh, he was in love with roller hockey. You know what roller hockey is? It's hockey. It's not played on ice. It's... uh, Played on rollerblades, and you play on cement. And uh, he got involved in a league, and he loved playing hockey all the time. So to be a good dad, I went out and bought all the hockey equipment. And I bought a net so we could practice in the driveway. I bought all the pads for the goalie. He wasn't interested in playing goalie. He just needed target practice. I got the big pads on my legs. I had the waffle board on one hand and the glove and the big thick hockey stick and the helmet and chest protection. You know, I had all this stuff. And we'd go in the driveway and he would work on his slap shot. So um, this one particular day, we go out to practice a little bit and I put all the stuff on. But I didn't put the helmet on and I don't know why because I just thought my cat-like reflexes would serve me well or I didn't want to mess up my hair or whatever. I don't know, but I didn't put the helmet on. And there I am. Well, you know where this is going, right? So there I am in net, and he's, you know, flipping shots here and there, and then he rears back and hauls off a slap shot. Doink. And uh, my son felt so bad. He's like, oh, Dad, you know, I'm so sorry. And I said, no, it's not your fault. I didn't put on all the equipment, and so I was vulnerable in that area kind of think it works that way as we try to live as a Christian and try to live like Jesus. Maybe there's a part of our life in God that's sort of sagging a little bit. You know, we're not, the prayer thing, it's not happening too much for us. Where the Bible sort of, you know, in, the, in your room is kind of gathering some dust. You know, we keep saying, yeah, I need to do more of that. Or, or maybe we're not in, in, in fellowship. We're not in church often. We just figure, you know, once a month or whatever is good enough. And then we start to get disconnected. And then we come, become vulnerable. And that's when those temptations can come. And we're not at our best. We're not at our strongest. We're not fully protected. And that's when Satan can really say, ah, I see an opening. So I want us always to remember that great verse in 1 John 4 that says, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world anywhere else. That means other people. That means Satan. Greater is he that's in you. So know that he's in you to the degree that you welcome him to be in you. And I wish we would welcome him into our lives, into our hearts and our minds, so that we can have that strength, so that we can have that full protection, so that when evil and temptation comes our way, we can stand, as Paul says, and stand strong for the Lord, drawing our strength from him. Amen? Amen. Lord, we need you. We know that evil is real. We know that Satan wanders around looking for a vulnerable place to take residence. So, Lord, give us the courage to stand strong. Remind us about these elements of the armor that we might be fully equipped and protected as we live out each day of our lives. And we pray especially for our children, Lord, that you would put a hedge of protection around them and keep them close to your heart that they might be protected from all evil. These things we pray by faith in the name of the great one, Jesus. Amen.